Thanks, Lauren. Um, hey, it's good to be with you this morning. We're going to start off a new series uh, called Money Matters. We're going to just do a short two-week series. Uh, we're going to look a little bit today at generosity. But uh, before we dive into that, I just thought, hey, let's, let's just get some fun facts about money. So I got some facts here on the screen that we're going to go over, some things that maybe you know or don't know. But uh, only 8% of the world's currency is actually physical money. So a lot of it's just held digitally. It's just uh, in electronics. Um, the average person has $56 of loose change in their house. Maybe some more, <laughs> some less. Ruth might have more. She's laughing. Um, this one is very interesting. If you have $10 in your pocket and no debt, you are wealthier than 25% of Americans. So you're wealthier than eight, about 80 million people if you have no debt and just, just $10 to your name. Uh, for those math teachers out there, there's 293 ways to make change for a dollar. I remember doing something like this in school and it drove me nuts. Um, and I'm very analytical and it still drove me crazy. Uh, paper money is not actually paper. It's 75% cotton and 25% linen. I had no idea that until I looked that up. Uh, there's a farm in Delaware that mulches more than four tons, so like 8,000 pounds of U.S. cash, into compost every single day. So when money wears out, they send it somewhere. They used to burn it uh, or pierce it. And then lastly, I put on a, a question on there. Which denomination of U.S. paper currency has the shortest average lifespan? Any guesses? I thought it was the $1, because those ones always seem to be trashed, but it's actually the $5 bill. I guess the $5 bill is used more often than one in transactions, so interesting. Um, also, there's some, I, I found some fun facts about money in relation to the Bible. Jesus actually talks about money more than he did heaven and hell combined. He talked about money more than anything else except for one thing, the kingdom of God. That's, that's the, uh, that one trumps money. Uh, it's in 11 of the 39 parables, and according to one researcher, it's one in every seven verses in the Gospel of Luke relates to money. So that could be possessions, finance, something to do with money. I thought that was pretty interesting. So the Bible talks a lot about money, and sometimes in church, and especially in our church, we don't talk about it that often. Um, but we're going to do a, a short series on it, and I think it's really going to be helpful for us. So today we're going to look at uh, the topic of generosity. And in our prayer time before service started, kind of the, the sense of God wanting to purge and clean up, um, maybe inside us, our hearts, maybe some uh, unhealthy attachments we have to possessions, to different things. And so I'm really excited to see what he's going to do with that. I'm going to start off by reading Matthew 6, uh, 19 to 21. This is part of the Sermon on the Mount, uh, famous verses that you've probably heard. It says, don't store up treasures here on earth where moth, uh, moths eat them and rust destroys them and where thieves break in and steal. Store your treasures in heaven where moths and rust cannot destroy, and thieves do not break in and steal. Wherever your treasure is, there the desires of your heart will be. And I think as I go through this message today, you're going to see that connection between our heart and our treasure, so our heart and finances. They're, they're linked together. Um, it says here, it kind of follows where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So like your heart follows where your treasure is, but I think it also goes the other way, where our heart, what's, what's kind of entrenched in our heart is going to lead us to either build treasures here on earth or build treasures in heaven. Um, when I kind of read this verse, it reminded me, um, we just recently watched The Lord of the Rings, uh, the first movie, because my son Ezra just read the first book. So we watched that, and uh, there's a scene in there where Frodo, the ring falls on his finger, and those, those ten uh, undead kings are trying to get it, and the ring wants to go back to its master. And so as they reach out for it, the ring is just lifting his arm, and he's trying to hold back, but it's just, it wants to go back to his master. And really, I think money is very similar. Money by itself is neutral, but it follows our heart. And so money is going to go where we have um, chosen in our heart to uh, store our treasures. Is it going to be here on earth, or is it going to be in heaven? I think to, to fully understand um, the concept of finances and how, how God views them in the kingdom... Uh, we need to look at a principle called stewardship. So maybe you've heard that word, maybe you haven't. But I'm going to compare ownership and stewardship. So ownership is um, viewed as like the person has rights. When you're an owner, you have rights. But when you're a steward, you have responsibilities because it's somebody else's things, possessions, whatever that's entrusted to you, and you have responsibilities to take care of them. You could also think of stewardship uh, and a steward as somebody who is a trustee. 
So in a trust, things are put in a trust, and trustees take care of them. Um, I've, heard, I've heard the parable of the great pearl used to describe this, and so I'll, I'll share that with you. Um, but before I do, I think the parable of the great pearl um, kind of has two different um, interpretations that I see. Um, it's this person that's going out searching for a, a pearl of great price, and he, he wants to find it. And I think that can be Jesus. So Jesus is searching for us. To, in, in his view, we're the pearl of great price, and he'll pay any price for us. And he did. He paid with his own life. But I think it also can be viewed as us, as us trying to find the Lord. There's, there's something inside us that God built us this way, that there's a hole, a God-shaped hole, that I hear people say, that we are searching for that pearl of great price. And when we find Jesus, we realize, oh yeah, that's, that's what I've been missing, and I'll pay any price for that. So just kind of uh, go along with this story with me. So um, there's, a, there's a man, he goes to a new city, and he hears that there's a jeweler that has uh, pearls. And so he's in search of the great pearl that's just missing in his life. And so he goes into the store, and he goes up to the merchant behind the counter, and he says, sir, I, I hear that you sell pearls. And he said, the merchant says, I, I have one. And the man's like, okay, well, I'd like to see it. I'm, I'm in search of this, this perfect pearl that I haven't been able to find yet. So the man lifts up from behind the counter this pearl, and the guy's mouth just drops, and his eyes get big. It's the pearl he's been waiting for. It's the size of a golf ball. It's perfect in every way. It's just shining and glimmering in his eyes. And he says, I'll take it. What's the cost? And the merchant says, well, to be fair for everyone, it's the same price no matter what. It'll cost you everything you have. And the man says, fine, I need it. I need this. And so, well, how much do you have? And the man replies, I, have, I think I have like $10,000 in my bank account. It's yours. And the man says, sure, I'll take that. What else do you have? And he feels in his pocket. He said, oh, I've got like $200 in change here. It's all yours. Okay, I'll take that as well. But what else do you have? And he says, well, I mean, I guess I have my savings. I have my 401k. Okay, I'll take all of that as well. <sighs> wow, that's a big price. And then the merchant asks him, is there anything else you have? Well, I mean, I have things. I have jewelry at home. I'll take those too. You'll take my jewelry? Yeah, and your house too. Man, you really do mean that it's going to cost me everything. Fine, I, I guess I could uh, drive to my sister's house and live with her. Do you have a car? <laughs> yeah, of course. I'll take that as well. And he hands him his keys. And wow, this has cost me everything. But he looks back at the pearl and he's like, I, I feel completed now. And so he turns to walk out the door, and as he gets to, towards the door, the, the merchant says, excuse me, sir, and he said, what? I, I've given you everything. He's like, no, come, come back here. And as he's walking back to the counter, he holds out his hand, and he says, here, I want you to have this. And he said, but I, I gave that to you to buy the pearl. And he said, yeah, I know. I, I own these things, but I am going to give them back to you, and I want you to use them. I want you to actually enjoy them. But from time to time, I'm going to ask you to use them for things that I want you to use them for. I may ask you to use your kitchen to make a meal for somebody in need. I may ask you to use the car to drive somebody to a doctor's appointment or to use your house to have somebody over that's in need. And so the man says, absolutely, because I get to have this great pearl that I've been waiting for, and I still get to have all this stuff. Absolutely, I'll do whatever you want me to do with it. That's how the kingdom works, and, and that's how it works with God. It's a, it's a price he, he asks us to, to give, his, give all of ourselves to him when we accept Jesus. He becomes Lord, and that means everything we have is now his, even in our life. Yet God doesn't do it as like a master and a slave where it's now it's all mine and too bad. It's now I want to partner with you, so I'm going to give it back to you, but I want you to use it and partner with me to spread my, my love to others. You know, it's also in the, in the Bible about the parable of the talents. The talents aren't our skills, but talents is a, a denomination of money. But God wants us to use, um, use things that he gives to us that could be our time, our money, our um, abilities, information, um, relationships. And he wants us to use them for his kingdom. In Matthew 25, 21, uh, in that talent parable, at the end he says, Well done, good and faithful servant. 
you have been faithful with a few things, I will put you in charge of many things. And that's what we should be striving for, is for God to say, well done. You've done well as a steward. Um, that God will hold us accountable for being a good steward. And um, he's not a, an unjust God, but he's going to give us more based on how we use it or less based on how we used it. So on that continuum of ownership on one end and stewardship on the other, how do you view yourself? Are you more towards the side of owner, like the things I have are mine, or on the other side where, no, God's blessed me with all these things and they're his and he lets me enjoy them. I think that's a, maybe for some of you, you've never heard that before, but I think that's an important thing for us to, to understand when we uh, talk about money and finances because it really shapes the direction that our heart wants to go. And I think in your life, you probably, you'll see yourself shift in different ways, in different seasons. Um, but I think what we want to do is um, become more of a, a view of being a steward. So today, um, I'm going to talk about generosity and being a generous giver. And that's actually one indicator of being a good steward. Um, our culture uh, might say there's reasons to give, and that might be give if it benefits you, give if there's anything left over, or give out of a sense of duty. And those same things can filter into a Christian's life, into a church, but I don't think that those are uh, ways that God wants us to be givers and generous. We're called to live counterculturally, and so let's look a little bit of what the Bible says about being a generous giver. In 2 Corinthians uh, 8 and 9, there's really some really good chapters. I'm not going to be able to cover uh, much of it, but there's some really good, I'm going to cover a few verses, but I, I would encourage you to go read those verse, uh, chapters on your own. In uh, verse, uh, chapter 8, verse 3, it says, For I can testify that they gave not only what they could afford, but far more, and they did so of their own free will. And verse 5, it says, this is talking about the, the uh, church in, I think, Macedonia. Um, they even did more than what we had hoped for. Their first action was to give themselves to the Lord and to us, just as God wanted them to do. In verse, uh, verse 12, it says, Whatever you give is acceptable if you give it eagerly, and give according to what you have, not what you have, don't have. So there's, those are some principles of what giving looks like from the kingdom, that it's uh, generous, it's uh, above and beyond. Um, verse 5, it's about giving ourselves to the Lord first, because getting our, our hearts aligned with the Lord allows us to be generous givers. And it's something that um, we actually then become eager about giving because it comes from a different place. But today I want to focus on three things of, that answer the question why we should be a generous giver. I think being, uh, or understanding three things that being a generous giver unlocks will help us in our view of money. So the first thing that being a generous giver unlocks is it helps to break the hold of money. Now, the Bible has a lot of negative, bad things to say about money, or warnings, I would say. But really, like I said earlier, money is neutral. It's really how uh, we're aligned with it. So we'll read some verses here that describe uh, some of the pitfalls about money. Uh, in 1 Timothy 6, 9, and 10, uh, the desire for wealth leads to temptations and a trap. It says, But people who long to be rich fall into temptation and are trapped by many foolish and harmful desires that plunge them into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. And some people craving money have wandered from the true faith and pierced themselves with many sorrows. Again, money is not evil in and of itself. But it's the love of money. It's the craving. When money becomes above God, when money becomes above either other things, relationships, it, it becomes an idol. Uh, wealth can also be deceitful. Um, in the parable of uh, the, the soils, uh, the third soil, it says in Matthew 13, the seed that fell there among the thorn represents those who hear God's word, but all too quickly the message is crowded out by the worries of, of this life and the lure of wealth, so no fruit is produced. So there's, cares and, there's other cares and concerns in this world, but the Bible continually points out, and that's why there's so much time spent on it, that money is one of the chief rivals for our hearts. Um, in 1 Timothy 6, 17, it also describes money as being an uncertain place to put our hope. Uh, he says, teach those who are rich in this world not to be proud and not to trust in their money, which is so unreliable. 
Their trust should be put in God who richly gives us all we need for our enjoyment. I really like this verse because this is one of the, one of the places, I, well, a few places I would say, that it really talks about money in a positive way too. Money is meant for our enjoyment or our possessions, our wealth, because if it's coming from the place of um, more of a stewardship, God wants us to enjoy the things, but he also wants to um, be first in our lives. Um, and then one more thing we'll say about this um, area about breaking the hold of money is when we're able to be generous, it uh, allows um, God to keep that, that top seat in our, in our lives, in our heart. I mentioned earlier about Matthew 6, where we talk about the storing up your treasures on heaven, in heaven or on earth. And a few verses later, in verse 24, Jesus really compares money to his chief rival, God. It says, No one can serve two masters, for you will hate one and love the other. You will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and be enslaved to money. So pretty, pretty sharp uh, contrast there. You will love one and despise the other. You'll be de- or devoted to one and despise the other. And I, I wanted to point out here too, it's not, it doesn't say that you cannot serve God and have money. It's you cannot serve God and be enslaved to money. So when you put money above God, that becomes an idol and you can't do that. You can't, have, you can't serve God and have money as an idol above God. So God uh, offers a choice that we can serve him with our money um, and we can store up treasures in heaven or we can store up treasures on earth, which um, is not eternal. Uh, one last thing that when we are able to be generous and we have a heart that comes from generosity, it allows us to fulfill the greatest commandment that we're supposed to love God with all of our heart, our mind, our soul, and our strength. If money has a place above God, we cannot do that. And that's what God is calling us all to do. So being generous allows us to break the hold of money in our lives. But alongside that, to be able to do that, we kind of have to take a step back and kind of tie in with that stewardship principle that I mentioned before. And we have to view God as the source of all we have. So not even just that we give it all to God and um, release it to him, but God is actually the generator of everything. Um, everything comes from him. In James 1.17, it says, every perfect gift comes from God. Um, and understanding that God is the source of all we have is really one of the keys to being able to live generously, especially with our finances. Um, and viewing God in, as the source of all we have actually is very countercultural. In our culture, it's more about entitlement and about what I want and what I want to do. And so being able to set that aside really can only come if we're able to see the things that we have, the things that are in our lives are a blessing from the Lord. You know, that goes all the way down to how we're able to make money. And this isn't a new thing. This goes back to the Israelites thousands of years ago. In Deuteronomy 8, uh, it says, uh, this is a warning that's being given to the Israelites. It says, he fed you with manna in the wilderness, a food unknown to your ancestors. He did this to humble you and test you for your own good. He did all of this so you would never say to yourself, this is a key part right here, I have achieved this wealth and with my own, well, with my own strength and energy. Remember the Lord your God. He is the one who gives you power to be successful in order to fulfill the covenant he confirmed to your ancestors with an oath. You know, sometimes we can say like, oh, I, I, I made a good living, or I'm earning a good living. But even God is the one that puts breath in our lungs. God gives us, you know, each day is a gift from him. And, you know, sometimes I think that can be, that can sound very cliche, but it's really the truth. And if we don't have that perspective, we're not going to be able to carry that forward into things like our finances. And, you know, I do want to say that this, this whole concept of generosity, today it's, it's really the speaking about finances, but it's not just finances. It's other areas of your life, too. It's generous with your time, with your energy, with your um, emotional capacity. I mean, lots of different areas. But I think one of the chief ones is our finances. If we're able to release that part and bring that into alignment, a lot of the other ones uh, flow. So being a generous giver aligns us with that principle of stewardship. And part of that principle of uh, stewardship is that God is the source of all we have. And actually, he's the owner of all that we have. 
Another verse that I like um, that kind of just shows this and describes this is in Philippians 4. And here Paul says, uh, speaking to the church in Philippi, at the moment I have all I need and more. I am generously supplied with the gifts you sent me with Epaphroditus. They are a sweet-smelling sacrifice that is acceptable and pleasing to God. And this same God who takes care of, my, of me will supply all your needs from his glorious riches, which have been given to us in Christ Jesus. I think sometimes that verse 19 there can be taken out of context and just say, God's going to supply all of our needs. And, and it, it's, it's true. God does supply our needs. But when we look at that verse, we, we really rob the verse of its full meaning if we don't look at the verse before. Because there, Paul's describing their, their uh, spirit of generosity. So Paul doesn't just have all of his needs met. He has all of his needs and more. He's richly supplied with everything. And the, the things that that church gave to him were a sacrifice. They didn't, they didn't come you know, with no cost at all. They sacrificed to give. But I like this next part. It says, and that was pleasing to God. So to me, that shows that not only were they able to do the task, because we can grudgingly say, oh, I'm going to give, or I'm going to do this. But it was pleasing to God, which means that their heart was in alignment with, with the Lord. And so they gave from a place of, of, for me, it's that place of God being the source and a place of being a steward, that they were able to do that. And when they did, they were uh, above and going above and beyond. And because of that, verse 19 is true. And then Paul says, um, and the same God who takes care of me is so generous with me. Because of your act of generosity, he's going to take care of your needs. So I really like how those two verses go together. I do want to point out that it's not like a, a tit-for-tat type of exchange. It's not like a transactional thing. Uh, the prosperity gospel can kind of get onto that, that train of you give X amount and God will give you X amount. And it's not, that's not the, the intent of this. It's really a, a relational um, transaction. Um, God wants to partner with us, and he invites us with our, with our generosity and our giving to partner with him. Um, he provides for our needs, needs, and then we honor him by giving back, and then he's blessed by that, and he gives us again. They don't always come in the form of finances. They come with also peace and um, other types of things, but God gives us back. So that's the second thing that um, being able to be generous uh, shows us. And the third one is that um, it helps us in accomplishing God's purposes. And I think this one... In my mind, it doesn't get talked about enough, but I think this one is really exciting. When we are able to be generous, we're able to partner with God in what he's doing, not only in our own community, but even around the world. Um, now God is not somebody who needs our resources. He's God. He's the creator of everything. But again, like we just talked about in that previous one, that God wants to have a relational um, uh, dynamic with us. He wants us to be partners with him. And through our time and our money, our abilities, God allows us to accomplish things that we couldn't do on our own, but it also is a, things that uh, further the kingdom. So we're able to help send out missions teams. We're able to send a birthday gift to a missionary overseas because God wants them to know that he loves them and sees them. We're able to, to you know, help people get to doctor's appointments, bring meals to people when they're sick. Um, all, all those things through financial and other types of generosity. But we're able to partner with God and actually bring his kingdom here on earth. One example of this in the Bible is from Acts 4. Um, it says, uh, all the believers were united in heart and mind. And they felt what they, oh, and they, felt what they owned was not their own. Right? It's a stewardship principle. So they shared everything they had. The apostles testified powerfully to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and God's great blessing was upon them all. There were no needy people among them, because those who owned land or houses would sell them and bring the money to the apostles to give to those in need. I think it's really, you know, right there in our faces that this, this, this early church in Acts was acting from the stewardship principle. And because of that, the apostles were out there preaching, the good news was being, was being spread, and people's needs were being met. Now, for me, I don't know that everybody in this church sold everything they had, but I feel like if they were operating in that stewardship principle, whenever, God's, whenever God put it on their heart and said, all right, I'm ready for you to sell your land or your house, 
they willingly did it because they knew that was God's and they knew that it was going to help accomplish God's purposes. So these are the three things that are accomplished through getting, uh, being a generous giver. We're able to break the hold of money in our lives. We're able to honor God as the source of all that we have. And we're able to then partner with God in his, uh, in his purposes. Um, before, I, before we close, I'm going to just go over briefly. I felt like I need to touch on these points of how to give. So it's not part of the, the why, but I, I felt like I, we need to just mention this. So the how to give, I'm just, I, I don't know if I gave Damon a slide for this or not, but um, God wants us to give privately, not publicly. So when we're giving, it's, it's not about um, getting the recognition of man. It's about doing it before the Lord. We're supposed to do it gladly, not grudgingly. We're supposed to do it with a joyful heart. And we're, it's supposed to be integrated, not isolated. It should be part of our lives. And that's where I was talking about. It's not our, just our finances. It's all areas of our lives. But if there's any area that um, is out of alignment, so maybe you're, you're good at giving finances, but you're, you're greedy with your time and you don't want to give up that. There's, all the areas are, are, are a, a stronghold in our hearts. And then the last one, which I'll describe just a little bit, is first fruits, not leftovers. God wants us to, give, to have our giving be a priority, not an afterthought. So this concept of first fruits, I think, is important to understand. Um, for the Israelites, they would have like a first fruits offering. They had a, I think it was actually tied in with right around Pentecost. Um, but it was late spring, and that was, they brought the first fruits of their early harvest. So their spring harvest, they would bring that in anticipation of what the Lord was going to, to do with our harvest the rest, through the rest of the year. They didn't wait until they had all of their harvest done at the end and then you know, subtract all the costs and expenses and then give from that. They gave in honor like, uh, for the Lord of what he was going to be doing for them with anticipation. For us, there's kind of a way we could look at this is viewing giving from our um, earning, so our, our income, or viewing giving from our spending. And what that means is you view giving from what God has blessed you with and what he's allowed you to earn versus what um, you have left over at the end. So you take care of all of your expenses, and then if there's stuff left, I'll, I'll give, or I'll, I'll give based on what I have left. And God wants us to make uh, giving a priority to him. It's not just about the amount, really. It's about making the sacrifice to say, I'm going to commit to this, whatever amount, small, big, but God wants it to be a sacrifice, but he also wants it to come... Um, as a priority. You know, for us, are there areas in our, our budget, whether you budget budget or not, but are there areas in your expenses each month that you feel maybe have gotten out of alignment with God's desire and they pull your heart in the wrong direction? That's a, probably an uncomfortable question, but maybe we spend more on our vacations than we do giving to the Lord. Maybe our eating out, maybe our coffee, maybe our recreation. I mean, I'm a golfer. I know golfing gets expensive, but does, do some of those things out, uh, do we outspend on those versus giving to God? I'm not saying that to make you ashamed or feel guilty, but I think it needs to be brought out because if we don't recognize that um, our spending and our attachment with finances can, can lead us and shift our hearts to, to building um, our treasures here on earth versus heaven, then I'm doing a disservice to you by not allowing you to, be, to wrestle with that. And I'll confess for myself, I'm, I'm not a spender. I'm a saver by nature. So the spending part isn't as big a deal for me. But I have my own struggles with saving because then you can make saving your God and making your retirement or your other things your, become your God. And I've had, actually had to... I don't think I've ever told my wife this. She's standing in the back. But I've actually had to, to sit before the Lord and say, God, this, this account, this savings account, this retirement, it's yours. If you choose, if you choose for me to give it to you, I know that you'll supply my needs. And it's, it's funny I get emotional about it because I have that attachment to it. It's like, wow, that's my security. That's my security blanket. Being a saver, that's where I, that's where I excuse me, find my security. But I, I've also seen that when I've done that, I've had to do it several times. Like, 
all right, I, I feel like this has become my idol again. But God, if, if you want it, if you want even part of it, I'll give it to you. And he's actually asked me to give uh, different things above and beyond uh, my regular giving. And I've been able to do it with a glad heart because I actually submitted the whole thing to him. And God is a good God. Like, he wants to know that we're going to submit to him. It's not like he wants to take our finances and punish us with it. But, um, yeah, so I'm, I'm right there with you. It's not an easy subject, but I also have seen the other side of it where it's very freeing, and actually um, my heart has shifted. Um, I'm going to have some people pass out some cards. I'm going to have a, a take-home for you uh, for some action items. And while they're passing those out, um, go ahead and pass them out. Um, I'm going to read a verse uh, also from 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 9. And I thought this is a really a, a good encouragement for us of something to uh, take from the message today. It says, remember this, a farmer who plants only a few seeds will get a small crop, but the one who plants generously will get a generous crop. You must decide in your heart how much to give, and don't give reluctantly or in response to pressure, for God loves a person who gives cheerfully. And God will, give, will generously provide all you need. Then you will always have everything you need and plenty left over to share with others. That's the, the law of the harvest. If you're going to sow sparingly, you're going to reap sparingly. But if you're going to sow generously, you're going to reap generously. Our God is a generous God, and he wants us to be generous as well. And again, it's not just our finances, but that is one of the big hangups, especially in our society. So that's what the emphasis is today. But if there's other areas where you're not being able to give generously with your time, with your energy, um, bring those before the Lord as well. All right, so on the card, uh, we got seven uh, take or action steps here. I like these because I think there's one for every person, wherever, wherever you're at, doesn't matter. Um, so we'll just go over them together. The first one is start small. Start where you're at, not where you want to be. If, if you're not a regular giver and you're not regularly generous, it's not easy for you, start with something small. And God will honor that. It doesn't have to be uh, where you want to be because that's a big hurdle to, to tackle right off the, uh, the beginning. Second, what we just went over, give first uh, your first fruits. It's about giving at the beginning of the harvest to thank God what was to come, not giving out of what's left over. That really shows God honor, and it's, it also uh, shifts our heart. Uh, third one, uh, divert one specific expense towards generosity. Kind of touched on this a little bit ago with maybe there's things that are out of alignment. And this doesn't mean that you have to just give up one whole expense category, but is, is there some shifting that you can do in there? Can you eat out less? Can you buy coffee less? Can you golf less? Can you vacation different? You know, those are different things, but I'm not here to tell you what to do, but I think there's, so, there's something that the Lord wants us to purge and let go of um, and clean out that in our, in our hearts. Fourth, uh, give to a person or a cause that you care about with special attention to the poor and the church. The Bible does emphasize giving to the poor and the church as our main uh, areas of giving. But if there's another cause, like maybe it's autism, maybe it's, um, I don't know, some other like medical thing, try to find an organization that um, is aligned with, uh, with God. Like I try to give to places that, that also bring the gospel. So at, at Christmas with our kids, they, they actually look forward to this every year. We open up the World Vision catalog, and then they get, a, they get to pick out animals that they're going to give to to send across the world. They don't even know where they're going but they want to give four rabbits and two chickens and a goat and whatever. And then, and then we do some as a family too. Like we, me and Mima pour our, our money in and we say, okay, let's get something bigger that you guys can't afford, but, let's, but they actually have their own money that they put aside and we do something as a family. But that's, that's an area where they're not just helping people that are poor, but they're also bringing God's uh, love to those people. Fifth, uh, tithe if you can. Uh, a tithe is considered 10%. Um, that could sound daunting, if you, especially if you're not even giving right now, but just make it a goal and work towards it little by little, step by step. If you're already tithing, you consider, consider a graduated tithe. Just because you give 10% doesn't mean that there has to be a ceiling on it, right? God can, God can take more. Um, um, yeah, there's one, one example I'll share with you. I've got uh, enough time. Is John Wesley, so a famous uh, preacher. 
And he took this, this principle very seriously. And he had a salary of 30 pounds a year when he was, I don't know, in the 1500s. I didn't even look up when he was alive. But a long time ago. And he decided he was going to live on 28 pounds a year. So he had two pounds that he was going to give to the Lord. But he decided that he was going to do that, and he was going to keep that as a standard of living. So as his income increased, he kept his living at 28%. So then his giving went up and up, and it was graduated. And it's interesting because his income got all the way up to like 1,400 pounds a year. Yet he decided, I'm going to just live on 28 pounds a year, and he gave the rest away. And it's interesting because he did it for two reasons. He really saw the value of lifting people out of poverty, because that's where a lot of his giving went to. He wanted to lift people out of poverty. But the other part, which, is, which kind of shocked me, was he also saw that those, some of the people that he lifted out of poverty then became, their hearts became entrenched with worldly values for money. And then they actually went on a, a, the wrong path. And so he didn't want that temptation for himself. So by, by kind of maintaining his standard of living, he kept that away, but he also, uh, that temptation away, but he also helped other people. Um, and then lastly, this is for all of us, whether any of, uh, whatever of the first six apply or that you want to tackle, the seventh one is really cool and it's very important. It's watch what happens in your heart. Because we want to pay attention to becoming more free, more content, more happy, and then we want that to let us, spur us on to be even more generosity. And from a worldly perspective, this might sound foolish because what else are you getting out of it? Or what, what tangible rewards are you getting? But really, the rewards are beyond measure. Some of those rewards we'll recognize and even see here on earth, but a lot of them we won't know until we get to heaven. You know, the areas we were able to partner with the Lord and, and further um, bringing the gospel to the world, we, we might not know until we get to heaven, or we often won't know. But... Um, just pay attention to how shifting your, your view on money um, allows your heart to, to align with the Lord. We'll go ahead and call up the worship team. Um, you know, this, these kind of things and those seven steps, they might seem kind of daunting. They might seem overwhelming. Um, I do think it would help for us to shift our mindset from a, a mindset of, of trying to more of a mindset of training. When we just try to do stuff, you know, it, a lot of times we fail because we might set our goal too high. Oh, I'm going to try to do 100 push-ups. My wife's probably back there laughing, probably thinking, you could probably only do two right now. Um, but if I set my goal to do, I'm going to do 100 push-ups within a year or in one day within a year, oh, I could get there because I could take little steps and I could make it happen. But if we're just going to just try with our own effort, we're going to fail. So we want to have more of a training mindset. And part of training is the Lord being alongside you, too. It's not just from your striving and effort. But we also have to realize that making financial adjustments in our lifestyle, it's going to take a little bit of time. But make little steps and let those build. Um, and generosity will be the same way. I'll leave you with one last question that uh, Pastor Sam and I, uh, especially Pastor Sam, used in our finance classes that we had. Are you going to let your money uh, direct? Are you going to direct your money where to go? Or are you going to allow your money to direct you? So it's kind of like the budgeting principle. By budgeting your money, you're telling your money where, where it's going to go, and it's going to be effective, and that's, that kind of plays out with giving, with other areas, and you're going to be efficient that way, versus more of the spending mindset where I'm just going to spend on my emotions are going to dictate where my money goes, my um, other things, the, the world, what the world says is going to dictate where my money goes. So um, kind of keep that in your mind, of what, what or how do you want to let money um, shape you. And then I'll also offer this to you. I'm not, we're not going to offer a finance class right now, but I personally would love to meet with anybody that wants to go through one of those, those six things, uh, or if there's something else that you want to go through and you need help. I would love to meet with you, and don't feel like it's a burden. I, I hope that all of my, well, not all of my hours, because my wife would be mad, but I hope I actually, my schedule fills up with a lot of you that want help doing this. In our finance classes, I've had people that have taken them, and they're like, they were in good financial situations, but they were able to be more effective. They were able to shift their view on giving, their, their view on saving, the, all these different things. But it takes help sometimes. You need an outside um, eye, and you need somebody who's not, their heart isn't really attached to the, to the money the way that you are.
So if you would like that, I felt like God said, put it, on, put it out to them and make them come up to you and ask for help. And so you can ask for me here at church or you can email me and I would love to help you do that. Um, so we're going to close and uh, I'll pray, but we're also going to have ministry time up here. Um, I was getting the sense too, and Martha confirmed with me this morning that this ministry time is, is more about emotional and spiritual healing. So if there's something with finances, with money, if you've had past hurts or, or things that you feel that, that you need prayer um, to help break, please come up. There'll be prayer people up here to help. Um, but Martha also did have one word for somebody today with a lung or bronchial or a breathing issue. So if that's you, um, Martha will be up here. If you don't know Martha, she's got the pepper hair in the back, the silver. <laughs> She'll be up here in the front. But she would love to pray for you for healing. And um, yeah, so let's go to the Lord in prayer. God, just, uh, just as I was delivering the message, I was just sensing the weight of finances. And it's a heavy topic, and it's something that just kind of sits over us, and it's in our minds. It's kind of carried inside us, in our emotions. And Lord, you talked a lot in the Bible about money. And it is one of the things that can become a rival God to you. And so, Lord, may this topic today about generosity and Pastor Barry's message next week just give us that chance to reset to look for areas in our heart that are maybe um, attached in an unhealthy way. If there's finance, financial decisions that we need to shift and there are patterns that we need to break, we just pray that your covering would be over people, over their minds, over their hearts. And Lord, the, the intention of this message isn't to bring about guilt and condemnation. It's about you shifting hearts to make people glad to give to you that's really what it is. You want us to be not just um, generous givers, you want us to be cheerful givers too. So Lord, may that um, go forward um, with each person today in your name. Amen. Thank you so much for joining us for our online service. Hope you will join us in person sometime. It'll be great to see you and meet you. Don't forget to subscribe to our Catalyst YouTube channel so you don't miss out on anything. And be blessed this week. And as always, thank you, Jesus.